So it used to happen all the time in my household that when we were on our way to shul on Shabbat morning, um, David would ask me what I was going to speak about. And then I would tell him uh, the, the sermon idea and he would say, mm, no, I don't think that's the right thing to talk about today. And then I would sneak off during the half Torah into the coach's lounge uh, there in the Shal Hevet gym and, uh, and come up with something new. Uh, but now we don't walk to Shul anymore. We just walk into the back house. So uh, my time is a is a little bit more constrained. But um, but it just so happens that I shared with David that I was planning this morning um, to speak about the complicated ethical questions that arise with presidential pardons. And uh, and David Light said, "No, I don't think that's for this morning." So um, so instead. Um, I want to share with you an idea that actually has been, um, has, I've been holding, uh, has been filling my heart um, for the last couple of days. So bear with me um, for, for a few minutes this morning. I'd be more than happy to offer a shiur, um, a, a, an extended learning on the, the very complicated ethics of presidential pardons um, at some point in the coming weeks, it's really interesting stuff, and um, I'm not sure I have the answers, but I think it, it raises a lot of uh, a lot of really good ethical questions for us. But what I want to speak about for just a few minutes this morning, before we turn it over to Ezra and hear his uh, his Torah today, is a post that Jesse Zilberstein put on Facebook this week. Um, so there you go, Jesse. Surprise. Um, Jesse wrote the following, and I only know this because David, <laughs> because David sat me down and had me read not only the post, but all of the many hundreds of responses. But Jesse wrote something along the lines of, play with me, if COVID miraculously disappeared today, what would you do tomorrow? And many of you know about this post because many of you responded to it. Don't look it up right now. I want to invite you to play with Jesse for a moment, if you haven't already this week, and to play with me and to think for a minute about what you would do if COVID miraculously disappeared today and you were able to do whatever you wanted to tomorrow. And while we're thinking about that, I'm going to invite you, if you want to, to, to write your answer into the chat, if you're comfortable doing that, or just just keep it at the forefront um, for a few minutes. While we're thinking about that, I want to tell you about a piece of the narrative that we encounter this week in Parshat Vayishlach. So you probably are familiar with the story. Yaakov, Jacob, has deceived his brother and his father, and he rather, um, I would say, connivingly got the birthright um, and the blessing that were both intended for Asaph, his brother. And Asaph is filled with rage against him and decides, and it says in the Torah, that when his father dies, he's going to kill his brother. And so, um, and so Yaakov knows that he needs, to, he needs to disappear. He needs to go someplace safe. And he ends up fleeing. And over the course of the last couple of weeks, we've been reading the story of what happens to Jacob, Yaakov, when he goes off on his own, when he leaves Beersheba and he goes out and he ends up going back to his extended family's home. He has uh, marries four different women. He has at least 13 children. He builds a very full life. And after 20 years, it's time for him to come home. And so he takes everything that he has amassed, all the wealth and all the humans that are now a part of his family, and he comes home. And this week's Parsha begins with him preparing to cross back over into the land and to encounter his worst demons, um, the, the, the brokenness that he's left behind when he first left. And, um, and he's scared. You can, you can read in the text, it says explicitly that, that Jacob's scared and he makes all kinds of plans. Um, he's going to give gifts, he's going to use diplomacy, he's going to do all kinds of things. Um, and something absolutely extraordinary happens. Um, he wrestles with an angel, wrestles all night long. In the morning, the dawn comes, he sets up his family, his, his wives and his children before him, and then he steps forward. And the text says the following, listen to this language. Vayaratz Esav Likrato. 
And Asaph ran toward him, Vayichabkehu, and he hugged him, Vayipol al Tzavarav, and he fell on his neck, Vayishakehu, and he kissed him, Vayivku, and they wept. Yisav ran toward him, he hugged him, he fell on his neck, and they, and he kissed him, and they wept. It's such a beautiful image that our, our Torah goes to great lengths to share in, in real detail, step by step of what happened in this extraordinary moment of, of, of heart opening that, that seems to have happened between the brothers. And yet our rabbis, of course, don't read it as a beautiful story of reconciliation. They treat Esav as though he's the embodiment of everything that we, the Jews, are not supposed to be. So Esav is ruddy and impulsive and rough, and he's a hypocrite, and he's a, he's a hater of peace, and they say he's a minuval, a degenerate. He, he's, he's, this, he's this awful person who's harsh and immoral and aggressive and violent, and all of this, of course, is in contrast to Yaakov, our own ancestor who through the, the pshat, the simple read of the story is actually, he's, he's actually engaging in a lot of deception and cruelty himself, but in the eyes of our rabbis, he's studious. They say he spends many years studying in the yeshiva of Shem and Ever. They say that Yaakov is morally wholesome and he's quiet and humble and he's dedicated to the wisdom of his, of his father and his grandfather, even when his behavior reads exactly the opposite. And I have struggled for years to understand if this is about confirmation bias or limited rabbinic imagination. Why is it that our rabbis can't see this story for exactly what it is? Just a simple, beautiful expression of sincere love and forgiveness, but they really don't. And in fact, what the rabbis say is that if you look in the text of the Torah, there in verse, uh, we're in chapter 30, chapter 33, verse four, what you see is that there are even special dots that appear, nikudot, that appear over every letter of the word vayishakehu, and he kissed him, and they say that that shows that what really happened was he, he bit him in the neck. He fell on the neck and he bit, Esau bit his brother in the neck. And if it weren't for a miracle from God, which caused Yaakov's neck to marbleize in that moment, to turn into stone, Esau would have killed him, except that it did turn into stone. So why are they crying? Because he, he lost all of his teeth when he bit his brother in the neck, okay? So, the, I mean, and if you think this is some, like an outrageous, extreme um, interpretation, it's repeated in Breshit Rabbah, in Tanhuma, in the Talmud. You see, it, you see it picked up in Pirkei de Rabbi Le'ezer. And let me just share with you this, what Pirkei de Rabbi Le'ezer says, that when Yaakov came back to Canaan, Esav came to meet him full of fury. He was bent on killing him. As it's written, the wicked will always plot against the righteous. And, a and Esav says, I will not slay him with bow and arrows, but I will slay him with my mouth and I will suck his blood. That's what Pirkei de Rebbe Yezer says about Esav. And yet, if you read the text, it appears to be a simple, gracious act of love and forgiveness. And, and that's what Rabbi Sam, Sam, Samson Raphael Hirsch says. He says that the tears are what give it away. That the, the tears are a reflection of genuine humanity. You can't fake tears. You can't pretend, you can't pretend to that extent. And, and I'm, I'm with, obviously with, with uh, Samson Raphael Hirsch here. I, I am convinced that what happened between Esav and Yaakov in that moment was a beautiful expression of what is possible when we believe in the power of individuals to change and to be transformed. And when we allow ourselves to change and to be transformed. If you look at what the hundreds of people wrote in response to Jesse Zilberstein's post on Facebook this week, you will be astonished to see that nearly all of them said the same exact thing. Marissa Tiamfuk wrote, I am gonna hug everyone I can. And, and many people wrote, I'm gonna hug my mother and then I'm gonna hug her again. 
And then I'm going to get a plane on a plane to Hawaii. And then I'm going to come back and hug my mom again. And, and Steve Burns, Steve Burns said, I'm going to weep. And then I'm going to hug every person I see, including people who I've never hugged before and never wanted to hug before. And then I'm going to drive to a car and I'm going to hug and kiss everyone and the Torah. Okay. And of the hundreds of responses, so many people talked about wanting, needing to wrap their arms around other human beings and hug and hold them. And, and yet it's that very expression that our rabbis don't trust here when Asaf does it. They can't believe that it's sincere. And I wanna say this morning that we don't know a lot about what happened to Asaf during those 20 years because our story follows Yaakov. We know a lot about what happened to Yaakov. We know the thinking behind the birth of every one of his children. We know the, the manipulations and the calculations that his many wives were making in order to try to get pregnant, to have more children with Yaakov. We don't really know very much about Esav, but I'm really curious what happened to him during his time of separation, during the time when he was isolated and estranged from his brother because that's where the magic is. Something happened to that man who had every right when he finally had the opportunity again to see the person who had harmed him, to bite him in the neck and to stab him in the back. And instead, all he wanted to do was hug him and kiss him and cry with him. And the reason I wanna know what happened to Asaph is because none of us have chosen to be in this time in the way that we are right now, but we are here anyway. And I'm sorry to tell you that we're not getting out tomorrow and we're not getting out next month. We have a little bit more time in isolation, in estrangement, in separation from one another. And I pray with all my heart that something of what Asaph was able to achieve in his time, we are also able to achieve that we somehow are able to do the work of heart and mind and spirit so that when we are able to encounter those from whom we have been distanced and maybe even estranged on the other side of this, even when we are justified in holding anger and rage and fury and wanting to bite them in the neck, what we'll do instead is open our arms wide and embrace them with love. That's the power of tshuva. That's the power that we all possess. Not only that we can change, but that we can allow other people to change too. And when we go back, we don't have to recreate the script that was, but we can together build a new script, a new story for a different kind of future. And I pray that we all will. I pray that we'll be prepared for that sacred day that Jesse asks us to imagine that day when we all find each other again and we reach out and we know and trust with all our hearts that this is a hug of the utmost sincerity, a hug that's a real invitation to a different way forward for all of us. A talk on the ethics of presidential pardons for some other time. I wish you all Shabbat Shalom.